I'm going to start talking now about exocrines. This presentation is based on some work done by MIT OpenCourseWare, and so this is a Creative Commons non-commercial share alike. So some of the questions that we have about an operating system are things like, what kind of system calls should it provide? What abstractions? And it really depends on the application that you are uh, going to be supporting and on kind of the taste of the programmers. So this is the OS programmer and also the application programmer on the other side. You can imagine possibly designing sort of an operating system and applications in conjunction together. So there's no single best answer. Right? The uh, paper that we're going to use here is from the mid-90s uh, based on work at MIT. And sparked a lot of interest at the time, so it was sort of some new ideas. We're going to be talking less today about specific mechanisms and more about just sort of some general ideas about design of operating systems. So monolithic kernel, right, is one possibility. So this is the traditional approach. So the idea is we have large abstractions and a monolithic kernel. A monolithic kernel examples of this would be, let's say, Linux, XV6, Windows. And in the monolithic kernel, all of the behavior that the operating system provides, or virtually all the behavior that the operating system provides, is sitting inside this protected kernel. So it's one big uh, collection of code. So commonly, uh, what will happen is the kernel is going to provide, and this is something I think I talked about on the first day of class, we provide each process its own virtual CPU. So the kernel provides. So uh, that CPU is not explicitly shared. It is only implicitly shared. And we looked about at the fact that right, we could time slice a uh, CPU. And so we would run, let's say, uh, process one for a little while. And then we'd run process two for a little while. And then process one for a little while, two for a little while, and so on. But the fact that this is switching in and out is oblivious to the process. To the, process. The, the process sees that it's running instructions one by one. And it just so happens there's a large gap in time between this instruction and this instruction. So what do we have to do in order to make that work? Well, one thing that requires is that the kernel is going to have to save all the registers, because it has no idea what registers this is using at an arbitrary instruction within this process. And then similarly, it has to restore all registers when we're beginning its time slice, because this context switch in or out and then back in is completely transparent. That's the goal. Okay. So the good parts about that, it's a simple model. A lot of the, let's say, kind of irritating details are abstracted away. You, this process doesn't really even have to think about it. It can just think about things as if it has just sequences of instructions that are happening. One part that's maybe not so good about it is a lot of it is hidden. So the scheduling is completely hidden from the process. The scheduling doesn't get any control, for instance, over how that uh, scheduling works. The process doesn't have any way of saying, well, I'd really like larger quanta that happen less often, or I just need some really short quanta. And it also may be slow. So if the process were involved, maybe it would know, hey, you know, I'm not even using floating point. I'm not going to bother saving these floating point registers and restoring the floating point registers, for example. There are a lot of clever tricks that a kernel can do, uh, having to do with virtual memory. So some of the things that it can do is uh, do lazy page table fill, let's say, right, where we don't fill up all of the pages uh, the virtual addresses in a process uh, and provide physical uh, and provide physical pages for those. Instead, we just do it on demand. Or let's say copy on write fork. Uh, another example is demand paging. 
right, where in demand paging, we could perhaps have a process that's bigger than available memory. We can page out pages to disk and then mark the page table entries as invalid. If we try to use one of those pages, then the MMU causes a page fault. The kernel finds the physical memory for it, pages in from disk, marks it valid, returns back to the process, completely transparent. Okay. We also get, again with transparency, shared physical memory. That is, if I have process A and process B, and they're both running Vim, I can reuse the same physical pages of the Vim executable among those two processes. So that's all stuff that a kernel can do for you, uh, which is nice. We also have uh, portable interfaces. Right? The interfaces we deal with are things like files and not, I don't know, disk controller registers. Or we're dealing with address spaces and not dealing with particulars of, a, of an MMU. We've got simple interfaces that hide some complexity. So all our IO and Unix is via file descriptors and read-write. No specialized operations for each device. The abstractions help the kernel manage resources. So the process abstraction allows the kernel to be completely in charge of scheduling. The file and directory abstraction lets the kernel be in charge of disk layout. And you may say, I mean, what, what is What's the alternative? What, well, I mean, what else do the abstractions do? They, so forget the what's the alternative. So the abstractions help the kernel enforce security as well, right? We have permissions on files. We have processes with their own address spaces. Part of what we do on a lot of this is lots of indirection. That's how it's implemented, right? This is the fundamental theorem of software engineering that an extra level of indirection can solve any problem, right? So we have file descriptors, virtual addresses, file names, process IDs, all are levels of, or, or types of indirection. And that helps the kernel do virtualization, uh, hide things, uh, revoke things from users without them seeing because of that level of indirection, do scheduling. So when we have a monolithic kernel, it's one big program. One big program means it's easy for any part of code to call any other part of code. Okay, so easy, for subsystems to cooperate. Right? One subsystem can, uh, if, it, if necessary, read the data structures of another subsystem. It can easily call functions in another subsystem. Okay? And all the code runs with high privileges. So we don't have any security restrictions, let's say. Um, for the most part, this is a good thing. Uh, there are some issues with this. For instance, device drivers would normally have to be linked in with a kernel. There's a lot of code that's in device drivers, and often device drivers are written by third parties. And there are a lot of potential bugs in those. And so there, it's kind of sometimes a problem that they run with kernel privileges, because any bad device driver can take down the whole kernel. These are big, right? That big software is complex sort of by nature. We know there are bugs in it and can be unreliable. There's a lot of work done to try and make uh, these large kernels reliable, but that is certainly the case. The abstractions can sometimes be more general than applications need. And if they're more general, that can be slow. So in this example we were looking at it with saving all the registers, it can be slow because maybe a particular application doesn't need all the registers saved. And if it were involved in the context switch, it could choose maybe what to do or not do. The abstractions sometimes are just not what's wanted on occasion. So maybe, so maybe I want to wait for a process, but that process is not my child. I'm not allowed to. Also, sometimes abstractions can get in the way of application level optimizations. I'll give an example. If we were dealing with a database, it um, may be an optimization the database can make. So the database may want to lay out all its data, right, using possibly a B tree, for example. And so it would, if it had the ability to talk to the raw disk, it could lay those out exactly as it wanted and do this block level I.O. Unfortunately, the abstraction does not expose block level I.O. It exposes reads, writes, and seeks. And the block level I.O. might be better suited for a database. So we've got this monolithic kernel approach where we've got the kernel and we've got these various subsystems within the kernel. Let's say we may have VM, file system, and processes, 